Our hymn for benediction is number 138 in the green covered books, Tantum Ergo, hymn 138. The divine praises, blessings be to God. Thank you. 
In the ends of the pews, you'll see cards with the words to the wood of life. I will sing the first two verses and ask you please to sing the refrain. <clears throat> Lord, you chose the cross, a cross with every breath. The perfect life, the perfect death. A crown of thorns has crowned us with eternal life you chose the wood the wood of the cross we behold the cross the hope the wood of life it's the way Son has now set us free Today we gather in this holy place Oh God with all your goodness and grace so shall your ways of peace and love be ever known you chose the wood the wood of the cross we behold It's the weight of all the weight of God's glory. May we never lose the wonder of the cross. God's Son has now set us free God's Son has now set us free Good evening, everyone. 
My name is Maggie Riggins, and I'm the Executive Director of Evangelization and Formation for the Diocese of Allentown. I would like to thank Monsignor Zemanik, Father Thomas, and the staff and parishioners of St. Ambrose for opening your doors as a host parish for this diocesan Lent retreat series. On behalf of Bishop Schlert, I want to express his regrets in not being able to be here in person. He's currently in South Bend, Indiana at Notre Dame University for a meeting with fellow bishops and an apostolic nuncio. So there's a special visitor from the Vatican um, at Notre Dame this week. So I want to give you a little background on this Lent retreat series before we get started. As you may remember, as a diocese, we celebrated the year of the real presence from 2021 to 2022, a time when we focused more attention on adoration, confession, mass, Eucharistic theology, ultimately to help us fall more deeply in love with our Eucharistic Lord. And when our year concluded on Corpus Christi in June of 2022, the National Eucharistic Revival was just kicking off. So Bishop Schlert liked to comment on how we did it first before the rest of the country got on board with focusing on the Eucharist. But in keeping our focus on the Eucharist, the source and summit of our faith, um, that was the goal of our Year of the Real Presence, and it's the goal of the National Eucharistic Revival. So we wanted to offer a retreat experience in Lent centered on the Eucharist. Last week, the series kicked off in the Slate Belt of Pennsylvania at Our Lady of Mount Carmel Church in Rosetto, which is near Bangor. And now here we are in the coal region of Pennsylvania tonight, and the series continues throughout uh, the diocese as we rotate locations, hitting every county in the diocese on Mondays in Lent. So again, thank you to Monsignor and to St. Ambrose Parish for being the host parish in Schuylkill County. I'd like to now introduce our speaker for this evening. Lillian Fallon is the digital media specialist for the Diocese of Allentown. She is also the author of Theology of Style, published by Ave Maria Press this past September, and has been a much sought after national speaker. So we're very blessed to have, us with her, have her with us tonight. Lillian studied at Ave Maria University in Florida before working in the fashion industry in New York City. She now resides in Bethlehem, PA. Tonight, she will be speaking on the topic of presence, informed by St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body and her own work, Theology of Style. So please join me in welcoming Lillian Fallon. have my laptop, so I'm looking a little nerdy right now. Um, hi, I'm Lily. You can call me Lily, not Lillian. That's my fancy author name, and I'm much more of a Lily kind of a person. So it's true, um, I work at the diocese as the digital media specialist. It's been such a gift. I love this job. I typically am giving talks to younger girls about Theology of Style, which is the book I wrote, and it's all informed by Theology of the Body. So I'm always talking about young girls about their worth and how that plays out with their personal style. So this is a little bit different for me, but it's all tied into the same thing, which is Theology of the Body and how God loves us and truly desires to be with us. So before I went to Ave Maria University, I had this perspective of the human body and the soul as very kind of two things that were like functioning in antithesis, like, you know, fighting against each other. And because I had that perspective, it really skewed how I understood how God had, has been pursuing the human person f for all of creation history. So... When I began to dive into this, into the depths of what does it mean to be made in the image of God, it completely changed how I saw who Jesus is, especially in the Eucharist and his presence. 
So people would say to me all the time, and I'm sure a lot of us have heard this one, people say, oh, you're made in the image of God, you're made in the image of God. But sometimes it's like, okay, what does that actually mean to be made in the image of God? Sometimes it's something we accept, but maybe don't really understand. Um, and so when I studied TOB, Theology of the Body, that's slang for the cool kids, um, I learned that the body is, uh, the body-soul unity we are not just a body and we're not just a soul. And we are both of those things. And both of those things, body and soul, are made in the image of God. So when I was a teenager, I had this perspective that the body was sort of this like bad thing that was always trying to like drag me down into temptation. Um, but as I was really informed by how God also made our bodies in his image, and that obviously that's good, it really flipped my understanding of that tangible, the, the material over on its head. And I was like, wow, the material actually is good. And Jesus, or God, throughout all of creation history has come to meet us in the material, in the tangible. We see that in the Eucharist. We see that in the sacraments. There's always this meeting of the divine and the material. So, so a lot of us... Um, when we don't have that understanding of the body and the soul, it can lead to kind of a skewed understanding of the human person as a whole. Um, so when I was in college and I studied theology of the body, I learned that our rational souls allow us um, to have an intellect and a will. We have feelings, passions, emotions, and we're able to perform great acts of love, make sacrifices, choose to do good or not. Um, and in the heart of most of us is this yearning for more. And in Genesis, Adam looked around at the animals and he knew that he was not one of them and it was his rational soul that brought him to the conclusion that he was not made in the image of animals but he did, still didn't really understand his identity until Eve and God said it is not good that man is alone man should not be alone I'll make a suitable partner for him so when Adam discovers Eve he declares flesh of my flesh bone of my bone. He realizes that he's not alone and that, hey, this person also mirrors me and who I am and vice versa. And she has an intellect and a will of her own. And we're definitely both not made in the image of animals, but in the creator. And the creator gives Adam and Eve this mission to take care of his creation and to be fruitful and multiplied. So, from the very beginning of creation, God made us for communion. And that's kind of what I'm trying to get at with all of this, is this original call for unity. We weren't made to wander the earth because we would never be able to understand, or Adam would have never been able to understand who he was if he was all alone. And he needed Eve's presence to help him understands God's presence and vice versa. And if man had been made alone, it would be contrary to God's own nature and the divine economy of God, Father, because, you know, the, the Trinity exists in constant communion with each other, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, so this is also reiterated in John 17, 21 to 22. When Jesus was praying to the Father concerning man, he said that all may be one as we are one, so that man may be one as God is one. And so, as I said before, God exists in this never-ending communion of love shared between Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he is love. By simply being made in the image of this wondrous God, we too participate in his unitive love, and we are called to self-gift so that we can partake in the ultimate goodness found in living in communion with others and God. So this call to unity is at the core of our beings. So when we were first made in his image, it's our bodies and souls that reflect the unity within God himself. And so throughout theology of the body, John Paul II, he regularly quotes this um, Vatican, Vatican II document, Gaudium et Spes, 
And this really illustrates the importance of living in communion. It says, this likeness reveals that man, who is the only creature on earth which God willed for itself, cannot fully find himself except through a sincere gift of himself. So the key takeaway is the truth of self-gift. We only discover ourselves through a sincere gift of self. And I think a lot of us can recognize this in our day-to-day lives, maybe not in such an obvious way. Um, On a physical and spiritual level, we do this through the spousal union between a man and a woman when they make a vow and they give themselves to each other in marriage. But we feel this call to unity and presence with each other in an everyday way, whether you're married or not, because it's etched into our, the very fiber of our being. We're constantly, we're constantly Adam who is seeking another person to say, oh, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, another person to be able to look at and say, wow, you reflect the love of God and I want communion with you. We're constantly looking for that in our day-to-day lives, whether we're at the grocery store and you just strike up a conversation with a random person and you walk away after having shared a really human moment and you're like, wow, like being human is really great. There are also times when it's not great, like when you're driving and someone cuts you off, but there's so many times where I I recall being in New York and I'd be on the subway and I'd just start talking to somebody I didn't even know and I'd be so heartened by this connection that somebody I never had even met before but I found the beauty of God in them just in this random moment on the train where we were sharing who we were to each other. So the human person is constantly, we're always doing things that share ourselves with others. Um, Like if you think about sending a cat video to your mom or reading to your grandchildren or listening to a friend who's really stressed about work, that's an act of presence to that person who's right in front of you. And it's an act of unity. Your presence is self-gift. Your presence is an act of unity. And I think that we can all agree that we feel a great sense of fulfillment when we're doing things that help others. I mean, I immediately think about nurses and how, like, how could anybody go into a profession like that where they're taking care of the physical needs and ailments of others, even if it's at the detriment of their own, their own self and their own health. Um, I think about people, um, the, the, I think about firefighters, I think about um, men in the military. It's incredible how people will sacrifice themselves for the good of others. And when I talk to those people, they always talk about how it's fulfilling to give themselves in that way. And then on a smaller scale, I think that when we're with our family, and like I said, if you're just sitting and spending time reading a book, say, to your niece or nephew or grandchild or your own child, there's an act of self-gift in that moment, and there's so much fulfillment in that, even that simple shared moment. And the only reason that we're like this is because we reflect who God is. God is constantly giving himself to us. And it's crazy to think about creation history, like I said, it just seems like God constantly coming down to us and trying to make it work, no matter how many times we mess up. We think about, you know, the fall of, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, the apple, the old story, and we think, he's like, okay, you, you made a mistake, but I can work with that, and God's greatest creation is that he can bring good even out of bad. And God is chasing us throughout all of creation, all of our history. So the end goal for God has always been to be with us and to be present with us. 
And he is so desiring to be with us that he went through the most painful death so that he could, one, be with us on earth in a very tangible way. And we have that through his time here, but also in the Eucharist and the sacrifice of the Mass. And then number two, so that the gates of heaven could be open to us and we could be with him forever. So he comes to us in a very tangible way way in our day-to-day lives on earth, but then also in an infinite way through heaven. He wants to be with us so much that we have literal communion in the Eucharist. We consume his body and blood to be one with him. And like I said, in the consecration, we live out the passion again where Jesus died for us so that we may be able to go to heaven and be with him for eternity. When I talk to young girls, I think that's the most important thing that I try to convey to them is just how important they are that from the beginning of time, God wanted to be with them, that he thought of them and called them by name from eternity, and that he would do and did everything possible to be with her and you as well and me that there is nobody who can take that girl's place in heaven and I think there's so many of us still that hurt and don't feel that that like that understanding that we were called and like I said called by name specifically So it's really mind-boggling to consider the lengths that God went to to be in union with us. He took on our sin, died for us in the most lonely way, the most lonely death, where he was betrayed by his friends. They left him alone to die so that we don't have to be alone when we die. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, Could you not wait one hour with me? that always especially hits home with me, that he was suffering and he just wanted to be with his friends. And I feel like he's talking to me whenever I hear that. Could you not wait one hour with me? Like whenever I'm like, you know, thinking about going to adoration, I hear that like, you really couldn't just wait one hour? Because he's still asking us that constantly. Or... Could you not, like, you know, come to Mass on Sunday? Just one hour on a Sunday? He's saying to us, I love you so much, I died for you. Just spend one hour. Because he wants to just sit with us and to look upon our faces and be with us. And he doesn't need to be with us in his suffering. But he just wants to. And I ask myself, wow, why is it so hard to make time just to sit with him so that he's not alone during Holy Week, in the garden, on the cross, on the way to Calvary? Why can't I be more like Simon and help him carry his cross? And why can't I let Jesus help carry mine? And Why can't I go to confession so that the burden of my sins embodied in his cross may be lighter for him? so that I may give back my love to Jesus, offering him the only thing that he really wants, which is just me and just you as you are. From the beginning, God has moved mountains to be with us, to be in union with us, to be present with us, to give our presence in return as a gift that we can freely give back to him. It feels like like such a small thing, when it feels like it's disrupting my week. But if we look at the years and years and years, hundreds of years of Jesus pursuing us constantly, no matter what, and I know that when we look back on our lives and all the struggles that we've been through and kind of reframing and being like, I've been through a lot of hard times, hardships, cried a lot, felt alone a lot, but how was God pursuing us in those moments? And I would challenge everyone here to think about 
what were the different ways that, my, that your life reflects that creation history where God was constantly saying, hey, I just want to be with you. Hey, I just want to be present with you. And then we say, eh, actually, no. And then he says, it's okay. I know you made a mistake. I'll work with it. Let's try, let's try again. So what are the ways in our own lives where we kind of follow that same pattern? So as we know with any relationship, reciprocal presence is what keeps it alive and thriving. And may we use this Lent to fully be present to Jesus in the Eucharist and for eternity. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lily, for your reflection on the physical, the spiritual, the self-gift, and how we are called for communion. Um, at this time, uh, we will be having some refreshments over in the hall, um, so you're more than welcome to join us. And especially if you have any questions for Lily, she'll pop over there so you can have a nice informal conversation with her. Also, if you would like assistance in getting from the church to our refreshments, there is a handy-dandy golf cart that's available. So if you would like a ride over to the church hall, that will be available for you as well. So I want to say thank you to our musicians. Thanks again to Monsignor and the Parish of St. Ambrose for hosting us this evening for our diocesan Lent retreat. God bless, and I hope to see you all over at refreshments. Thank you so much.